Well, good afternoon and welcome to Connecting Point. My name is Travis Jones. I'm the Minister of Spiritual Formation at Hillside UMC. And it's my honor to be here today with you. And uh, I hope you enjoy uh, our, our Connecting Point. Now, this actually is our first real Connecting Point of 2021. A week back, or two weeks back, we actually did one and it was a replay. And so this one is our, our actual first new content Connecting Point of the year. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you what Connecting Point is supposed to be. Now, Connecting Point is designed to be a jump off the diving board into the pool of God's Word, the deep end, and then shooting right back out. Just a really quick kind of immersion. And when you come back out, just to give you something to process, to really think about as you go about the rest of, of your week. And and so hopefully you'll gain some type of um, uh, connection uh, through this that wouldn't have otherwise been possible in this. And and so this particular connecting point, I was thinking about it, and I wanted this one to be about uh, the new year because we're in the first month of the new year in January. And uh, I got to thinking about stuff, and I was reading through Scripture, and it popped in my head that wouldn't it be awesome to talk about the things that we hold on to? You know, as we go from one year to the other, we tend to make New Year's resolutions. I'm no different. I make New Year's resolutions every year. Um, I've almost got to the point where I, I shouldn't do that because I don't I don't keep them. But I make these New Year's resolutions, and the reason I make them is because I am there's something that was different or something that needs to be different from the year previous that that I didn't like. Things I'm holding on to, things that I've got. Uh, you know. When it comes to the gym, people look in the mirror and I don't like the way I look. So I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do these things. I don't like this. I'm holding on to this and I'm going to actually make that happen. Uh, So so it got me thinking about those kind of things. And I thought, you know, what a great topic. What a great topic to start with. And interestingly enough, the scripture I was reading was a, a very... It's a story in Scripture that when you read it, um, it's not it's not one you readily associate with holding on to things, uh, but it does. It reminds me of that. So we're going to get into that. I'm going to every once in a while stop and talk about some of the Scripture elements that are there. We're probably not going to be any longer than 15 to 20 minutes max on this, uh, because any longer than that, and I'll probably wind up boring you. Uh, so with that said, let's jump right into Scripture. And our first part of the Scripture is found in Acts. So we're here. Acts 19, 11 through 12. And I'm using the message version. You can use whatever your version you like. I just tend to like this version uh, the best for me. So it goes like this. God did powerful things through Paul, things quite out of the ordinary. I'm going to read that again. God did powerful things through Paul, things quite out of the ordinary. When I read that first part of the verse, it tells me that Paul had so much presence And so much power associated with him through Christ Jesus that there were things happening all around him. Things out of the ordinary, things that were supernatural in nature, and people were dumbfounded. Um, And as a side note, I'm just going to say this, the supernatural things and the out of the ordinary things out there should both be ordinary in occurrence and natural to us as believers. Because we are children of the Most High God. We're, We're children of the God who speaks things into existence, who is the creator of the natural and has the a power to, with a spoken word, change anything in a moment and recreate anything. So this scripture actually speaks of that to me. Now I want to go back um, and, and keep going. It says, God did powerful things through Paul, things quite out of the ordinary. The word got out and people started taking pieces of his clothing, handkerchiefs, scarves, and the like that had touched Paul's skin and then touching the sick with them. The touch did it. They were healed and they were made whole. These pieces, these pieces of of just random ordinary clothing that Paul was wearing were imbued with so much power and presence that they had the ability to affect and cause change because the presence and the power of the Most High God was was imbued with them. Uh, Not just change, but the ability to make people healed and made whole. Made whole is a whole other thing. Pardon the Pardon the language, uh, the the words there. But being made whole is not just being healed. You can be healed but not be made whole. These people were being made healed. Were people? Excuse me. Were people? These people were being healed and made whole. You know, this verse got me thinking about the things that we hold on to. And these folks were holding on to these these articles of clothing and uh, that were imbued with so much presence they caused things to happen. And yeah, faith played a little part in that because they believed in what they had in their hand and who. Uh, it was that God was in Paul, but I got to questioning whether or not they actually um, realized who God was or who the God in Paul 
was? And who did they really have faith in? You know, when you get to really thinking about this stuff, when you get to really thinking about the way that these folks were acting, they were taking pieces of clothing, they were taking handkerchiefs, articles, anything that you touch, they were holding on to that thing right there. Uh, because it's so much easier to hold on to something with power in it than allow the thing that imbued the power on it to reside within us. And I, I got to wondering about those those folks. You know, where, was it easier for them? Was it easier for them to hold on to these articles and these things like that rather than than get behind Paul and walk, right, and follow him as he followed Christ? Was it easier for them to do that? Um, I mean, because there's a huge difference in the thing that has been imbued with power and the one who gave it that power. Because, you know, if you look at the two, there's a huge difference. One is very limited and will fade away, and one will not, will never fade. It's that, that whole um, unending rivers of water, living water uh, type thing that he's been talking about. So, so at any route, um, when I begin to look at this, I begin to think about the things we hold on to. And it, it, it brought to my mind my own faith story. And at every point in uh, someone's life, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you my point, we, we start to uh, develop a faith story. Usually it starts a lot earlier on than we even want to admit uh, or even know about. But uh, mine started when I was younger. I was about seven. I was baptized at seven. Um, and uh, the Holy Spirit confirmed me uh, at about 16 uh, when I actually gave my heart to him and decided I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. But I remember up to that point, it, it, the faith that I had wasn't mine. It was something I was holding on to. It was my parents' faith. It was the thing that I was allowing to to dictate my life because my parents said that this was the way it was. And I would read scripture and things like that, but it was my parents' faith. I didn't have a real experience with with God. It was just it was just what I had known that they had told me. Right? So I had my parents' faith. And then I remember the day I was baptized. It was the water was cold. I was baptized in the basement of a church because that's where their baptistry was. Uh, and that water was ice cold. And I remember uh, I was seven. I got baptized and I came up and I was shaking and somebody thought, oh, well, the Holy Spirit's on him. And I was like, no, it's just cold. <laughs> it's just cold water. But I got baptized. And then at the age of 16, I had seen some abuses within the church and I didn't like the way people were acting because what I had read and what my parents had told me uh, didn't line up with how they were actually acting. So I viewed a lot of the people that went to the church that I was at as uh, they were hypocrites because they would say you don't gossip, but then I would hear them gossip. They would say you don't hurt other people. I would hear them verbally hurt other people. So I thought they were hypocrites. And at age 16, I would fight my parents on going to church. And uh, I remember one time my parents had went to church. And for me, I couldn't understand why they would go to a place that, that was like that. But I had, they had went to church, and they had left me at home. And I was sitting there watching TV, and it was a Sunday evening, Sunday evening service. And I was watching TV, but there was this curiosity inside me. And uh, as this curiosity was inside me, I, I began to watch this televangelist. And in that moment when I watched this televangelist, he, he said, if you want to give your heart to the Lord, and he explained what that meant, if you want to do that, you can do that right now. And so I said, oh, you know what? I've got nothing to lose by doing this. And so I got on my hands and knees and got up, on my, uh, up against my couch, and I began to pray, and I received Jesus in that moment. Now, what was interestingly and interesting enough is in that moment, I, I expected you know pixie dust to fall from the sky and things to be mark, markedly different. But after that moment was over, I, I felt a little peace, but nothing really was different in my life. So I went on uh, about my life. Now, fast forward another couple years, and we have the moment that my parents' faith literally translated over to my own. And what happened with that is I was going through a really rough time. And I remember sitting in the parking lot of my job, and it was just, it was, it was just weighing on me what I was going through. And I remember praying, and I, I, I can't explain it any other way than this, but I, I felt a presence in the car with me and a hand on my shoulder so much so that I looked up to see who was there. And when I felt the hand on my shoulder and I looked up, I, I felt this immense peace wash over me. And I knew that I knew who it was, that it was God. And at that moment, that's all it took for me. At that moment, my parents' faith turned into my own. It turned into my own faith. It's not something I was holding on to anymore. It was something that I now had. And it was something I had because I had this experience. Now, uh, could I have had that experience in front of my couch? Yeah, I could have. Uh, but I didn't because God's in charge of how that worked out for me. But it was the moment that my faith actually 
began. Now, it had been planted as a seed in me by my parents, but it wasn't mine until that moment, that moment of experience for me. It went from here to here. When I, when I was praying at the couch, God was there. He was with me. He took me at my word. But two years later, it went from here to here. And when it went from here to here, he reminded me of that moment back at the couch. He reminded me of my baptism. It was the most amazing thing in the world. So my point in this is uh, that was something that I held on to. Now, what happens, though, if you hold on to things that aren't yours and try to operate in them um, going through life? Right? What happens if these people had continually held on to these things that had touched Paul's skin and they began operating with them and, and doing things? Well, the scripture goes on to, uh, gone, goes on to say kind of what happens uh, in that situation about these things that, that we tend to hold on to, uh, these things that these folks were holding on to. And I want to read that to you because it's, it's very interesting. It's kind of a funny story, but it's also a scary story. It, it goes like this in Acts 13 through 16. It says, Some itinerant Jewish exorcists happened to be in town at the time trying and, and time tried their hand at what they assumed to be Paul's game. They pronounced the name of the master Jesus over victims of evil spirits saying I command you by the Jesus preached by Paul. Now I'm going to stop right there. Um this is this 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 scripture just it blows my mind when you read this. The itinerant they traveled around is what that means. Uh, the itinerant Jewish exorcists happen to be in town. They happen to be in town. They see Paul doing these things. They see people taking sh- pieces of clothing and touching Paul and healing. They see this happening, and so they think, you know what, you know what, I see what he's doing, and I think we can get on get in on that. And what I wrote in my notes is they had their math right, but their faith wrong. They were holding on to a formula, right? It was the faith of Paul that made these things possible. But these guys didn't have a faith of their own. They had what they'd been brought up with. They were Jewish itinerant exorcists. And they had this faith in them that they'd been brought up with, but it wasn't the same faith that Paul had. So they were going to try their game. They had their, their formula right, but their, their faith wrong. And they, they were holding on to this thing. And, and so they command these evil spirits to leave in the name of Jesus. Um, and so so what happens? What happens when we hang on to faith that that are things that aren't, aren't ours to hang on to, that specifically faith in this context, right? What happens when we hang on to this faith and, and, and we see someone else's faith operating, we try to operate out of this other faith and, and not the faith that's available to us in the moment? Well, this is how the story goes for these guys. Uh, the seven sons of a certain Sceva, now Sceva was a, as, as a Jewish uh, priest, uh, a Jewish high priest, uh, they were trying to do this on a man. Now, I, this part it just gets me. They were trying to do what they thought would work on a guy, right? He, he He's possessed. He has evil spirits tormenting him. And they were trying to do this on a man when the evil spirits talked back. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in this situation, I want to be doing the talking. I don't want to hear anything like that talk back to me. They tried to do this on a man, and these evil spirits began to talk back. And what do these evil spirits say? I know Jesus, and I've heard of Paul, but who are you? Now, when you hear that, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? That tells you right there they didn't have the faith that Paul had. They didn't have the Jesus that Paul had. This 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 demonic thing knew and had heard of, of, of Jesus, obviously, the Son of God, and they'd even heard of Paul. Paul had a reputation in the spirit realm at that point, right? So, so I mean, I don't know about you, but I would, I, I want to be infamous to demons. I want to be famous in heaven, but infamous, infamous to demons. I want, I want them to be like, whoa, I've heard of this guy. But for these seven sons of a certain Sceva, they said, Jesus, I know, and I've heard of Paul, but who are you? Then the possessed man went berserk. (laughs) He went berserk, jumped the exorcist, beat them up, and tore their clothes. This is naked and bloody. They got away the best that they can, or the best that they could. Um, It blows my mind. 
blows my mind that these guys would try this. They see this working and they look at it as a formula and they say, you know, what? I don't have this. I mean, I'm, I'm going to hold on to the thing because I think it works, but I, I, it's not really mine and I'm going to try this and see if it works, right? And this, this thing just literally lights them up. Um, it goes, it says, the possessed man went berserk and jumped on the extras, beat them up and tore off their clothes, naked and bloody. They got away as best they can. That tells me they were even being pursued. This thing was going after them. And all because they were holding on to something that wasn't theirs to begin with and trying to use it. It wasn't really theirs. The faith was not theirs. It was Paul's, right? It was Paul's. They were holding on to this thing. And he, he flat almost, this thing almost tears them up. All of this because of the things they were holding on to. All of this because the faith they had was in a formula instead of the formula giver. And most of the Old Testament, when you look at the high priests and, and you look at the Mosaic law, that's about a formula and a way of doing things. And then you get to the New Testament and then grace just falls, boom, right there in the middle of it and says, you know what? The formula is no longer sufficient. The great grace Grace says that, and I'm going to cover all of it with it. And so these guys were working on this formula, and they almost got their hand, they almost got their rear end handed to them, and they did by this this thing. So, so what does all this mean? What does all this mean, and what does it have to do with the things we hold on to? I think it means this: there's what we hold on to, and who we hold on to. We can hold on to things such as our parents' faith. And it never becomes our faith. Or we can take hold of the who, the one who is the author of all existence, the author of all things, the the God who was present and so powerful in Paul. We can grab hold of him. And we don't just have to grab hold of a garment that someone wears or the hem of his garment like the other story in Scripture. But we have access to the very throne room of God, and we have access to him. That same God that lives in Paul, we have the opportunity to allow that same God to live in us. So when those moments come up, we don't have to go, I think we'll try this. No, because we have authority from our Father. Instead of acting like the seven sons of a certain skeva, we can walk up to those situations and say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And this thing won't have the opportunity to talk because it can't. It's not going to go, I know Jesus and I've heard of Paul, but who are you? It's going to go, I know, and it's gone. It's not going to talk back because it can't. So the things we hold on to are big. Whatever we entered this year with, good or bad, it's something that we're holding on to. Now, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going is I'm going to pray. And in that prayer, I'm going to pray that the things that we've been holding on to, that we'll let go of. And that instead of holding on to things, that we will grab hold of the one who has been holding on to us since the very beginning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity in this year to share, Lord, and I ask that anyone who hears this, Lord, that you would give them pause to take inventory of the things that they're holding on to, whether it's their parents' faith and it hasn't become their own, or Lord, whether it's something from the past that has followed them because they've held it and walked into this new year with them. Lord, give them the strength and the clarity of mind to let it go and grab hold of you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name. All right. I hope that was helpful to you, um, and uh, I hope you benefited from it. Love comments anytime you want to give. Uh, We'll be doing another Connecting Point starting uh, in February, and I look forward to seeing you then. This has been Connecting Point.